Thank you. Okay, we are Thank now you, recording. Absolutely, um, you have all listeners. Yeah, yeah. Can you unmute? Uh, over, please, myself, okay. please, everyone, mute themselves and keep your camera turned off. Okay, now we can start. You can take the floor, Enrique. Okay, thank you. So, thanks, everyone. Um, this is another one of our seminars, our webinars um, in the MedTech series. Uh, these are webinars we organize to try to help you, the members of the portfolio um, at the European Innovation Council within the tech area, trying to identify areas where you can need help and we try to help you uh, find answers and network and, and allow you to move on faster towards the, the patient. And so um, the goal today um, is to talk about EMA, the European Medicines Agency. Um, you know, I, I knew from the past that EMA was very important, of course, for drug and stealth therapy and, and gene therapy and advanced therapies. And I knew for uh, companion diagnostics, EMA was also very relevant. So when you have a, an in vitro device and you need to couple it with a, with a therapy, maybe for oncology, and the device is used to monitor how these therapy is working or not working. Uh, can, you, can you mute yourself? So in those cases, it was clear that EMA had to play a role. But what I didn't know, and, and maybe I was a bit naive about this, is that EMA is gaining more and more role, more responsibility in the context of medical technology, medical devices. Actually, some companies from our portfolio, some of you reach out to me saying, look, discovery EMA is much more important. And, and they have an important role in the clinical validation, particularly, which is very important for the technical file to get the C marking. So clearly, we had to learn as a community more about the role of EMA, particularly for the C marking process. So I'm really, really grateful that today we have uh, Miguel Antunes with us. Um, he's at the European uh, Medicines Agency. But before we get started, uh, credit to who deserves credit. So Liva and Pana, who are helping me coordinate these webinars, thank you so much to both of you. But also, very special thanks to Barbara Garatana, because she's my colleague here at the EAC who's setting up the bridges between the EAC, my agency, and EMA. So thanks to her, I connected, I met Miguel Antunes. I'm really grateful for the work Barbara is doing. Um, so again, thanks, uh, Miguel, for finding time for us. Um, could you please introduce a little bit yourself and then uh, dive into your presentation? Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Enrique, uh, and not to take too much uh, of my time, just to uh, quickly thank the European Innovation Council for this uh, very nice invite. It's always a pleasure to interact with uh, um, a lot of stakeholders and important stakeholders, and this is a bridge that I agree with you is probably missing, so thank you so much. Uh, and I'm thanking you specifically, Enrique, for, for facilitating this. Um, and also to them, uh, uh, we are currently now almost 150 participants, so I would also like to thank them for the interest and to pick on what you presented. It's, it's true that the EMEA still has a, a limited role regarding the regulation of medical devices, especially if we compare its role with the regulation of medicines, but it is uh, growing and even though it's a limited role, I think it's a very important role and I will share some thoughts uh, about it uh, today. So about myself, um, I'm a pharmacist by training, but I um, did all my uh, professional experience and uh, um, um, postgraduate training re either on the clinical assessment or clinical epidemiology. And I've worked all my professional life in medical devices. So, um, and I've done that in my national uh, agency in Pharmed. I've worked there for almost uh, 25 years. And then there was this opportunity to move to the European Medicine Agency to support these projects re related to medical devices. So it was a very nice opportunity to bridge between the two. And I was very interested in, in this bridging. So that's in a nutshell, more or less my profile. Thanks so much. Um, the floor is yours if you want to start with the presentation. Perfect. So um, I will I'll try to be brief, not to bore you too much 
with slides so that I can also leave some, some room for questions. But uh, Enrique very wisely um, advised that I should also present a little bit what's the role of the EMEA, not only for, for medical devices, but also for medicine, so that you are a little bit aware of what it's currently doing. It's it's a very big agency, so even for us, sometimes it's difficult to <laughs> keep up the pace with all the activities. So just to briefly put us in the scene, so let me share my screen with you. I think you can see my screen now. Yes, perfect. Perfect, so let's start then. So, as I was mentioning, it is a big agency. It is a decentralized agency from the European Commission. Um, it was established in 1995, so we've very recently completed 29 years of existence. Next year it will be 30 years of existence, and we've had a consolidated role uh, in the regulation of medicines, either for human use, but also, um, let's not forget that, also for veterinary use. Um, it is a huge um, uh, agency also gathering a lot of expertise throughout Europe. So um, generally we, 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 we like to present round numbers, but we have a, 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 a database of experts that co cooperate with the agency of almost 4,000 experts all across Europe in very different expertises and capacities. Uh, we are the um, uh, we provide the secretariat for and the and the support for the seven uh, scientific committees that currently um, support the opinions that uh, are given by the um, by the agency, and we have a management board that gathers uh, what is our core representation to it. it it has a representation from all member states, civil society, also the European Commission and European Parliament. So that's the composition of our management board. We are almost 1,000 staff members currently working for the agency. So I've already mentioned this, that uh, it, we, it's very well known our role in a human medicines uh, authorization. Sometimes we forget to mention this important role of also authorizing veterinary medicines. Um, and so also beyond the, the, the main work of the agency that in fact is also, as I've presented, um, a group of, uh, it's in itself a network of experts. Beyond that, it uh, is also, it sits in a, net, a much larger network, cooperating directly with national regulatory authorities either for human medicines or uh, veterinary medicines. And in some cases also with some interactions with national authorities for medical devices in some capacities like this borderline discussions, for instance. Uh, so these interactions are also uh, foreseen and also with the European Commission, of course, because in the end, the EMEA does provide in terms of authorization of medicines, it's an opinion, so it doesn't grant the, the, the final authorization that is given by the European Commission. In a nutshell, there are different procedures for uh, authorizing medicines, but I would say that the EMEA is be best well known by the centralized approach, which means that it's one single uh, a, a positive opinion or approval that is granted for the placing on the market of, throughout Europe. So that's the, um, the philosophy behind the centralized procedure, but also the EMEA supports uh, other forms of um, approvals, like for instance, the decentralized procedure or the mutual recognition procedure. So only the purely national procedures sit with the member states. All others have some form also of support and interaction within the EMEA. There are uh, some medicines that are um, mandatorily uh, authorized via the centralized procedure, and these are seen as the very innovative ones. So the advanced therapies, medicines that are for the treatment of cancer, HIV infection, um, uh, neurodegenerative diseases. So uh, the very special ones or some um, uh, also very um, specific, like for instance, orphan uh, orphan medicines, the, uh, the designation of orphan medicines and then the authorization. Um, 
uh, and also for veterinary medicines, this concept of innovative uh, veterinary medicines um, places it on the on the scope of the mandatory centralized procedure. However, the centralized procedure is also open to other uh, medicines. For instance, if there is a new substance, it could also uh, be, uh, in theory, um, uh, under the the centralized procedure, I say in theory because this is a, these types of applications usually require a pre-confirmation from the agency that the the centralized procedure would be applicable for the approval of such medicine. Um, I've mentioned a lot on the output, so on the evaluation of the applications. Uh, there is also, of course, a lot of activities that go beyond the placing on the market, so mostly vigilance and pharmacovigilance activities that follow the safety of a medicine. But it's also important to highlight that EMA has put in place many projects and activities that support the pre-development of these medicines. And these range from um, what are more formal and structurized, and structural procedures like, for instance, the scientific advice, either for the development of a human medicine or a veterinary medicine, but for instance, the Innovation Task Force, which is a forum, very informal, where applicants can come and uh, ask questions regarding their development. And it's a very, it's, it's, the concept is pretty much of a think tank where the agency gathers expertise throughout the agency and the network to try to support them, the projects. And also some, 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 uh, some activities are also more dedicated to some specific projects. Uh, I would like to highlight also, of course, the support we give for the development of orphan drugs, but also our prime program, so Priority Medicines, which is um, a pathway that tries to accelerate the development and placing on the market of very innovative medicines. EMEA does thrive to engage with a lot of stakeholders from uh, patients' associations, healthcare uh, professionals, academia and industry. It has a lot of forums and platforms for those interactions. Some are standing platforms, others are consultation procedures, ad hoc meetings, workshop conferences. So. Uh, it's uh, it's a, a very important part of the activity of the agency, this engagement with all the stakeholders. Uh, especially relevant for the agency, I, I'm, I think uh, my colleagues from the, the, the SME office already did some previous uh, presentations uh, um, regarding their activity, but still it's good to highlight that EMEA has a specific SME office that supports the application uh, of a company to a, 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 an SME status or qualification that would then grant specific benefits for a company, for instance, in terms of um, getting fee reductions or getting additional support once this status is uh, granted. Miguel, question, and this SME office, this is mostly for medicines. We are not yet in the medtex part now. So uh, yes. Thank you for thank you so much for the question and to the opportunity to clarify. Yes, currently there is no specific, but also because there are no fees regarding our activities on medical devices. So actually, the need to have this uh, uh, support that would be mostly on the financial incentives, it's not there. But the medical device regulation does foresee that there is the possibility to levy fees for the activities, and it has a specific mention that if that happens and when that happens, SME companies status is to be considered uh, for the setting of those fees and of course also on the on the possibility of having a, a, a reducted fee so once it comes and if it in when it comes it's already foreseen in the regulation that this will have also a specific status so the medtech companies cannot call the sme office yet because sme office is for drugs mostly uh, medicines 
Yes, currently, yes. <laughs> And unless they are also developing, which could be the case, some companies are, or small companies are also have mixed portfolios or have two products. So if that's the case, of course, they would benefit from that. And also our, our colleagues from the SME of, office always say that it's also good to engage early so that they can also, uh, because even the, the granting of the status also takes some time. It, it, it needs some, uh, if there is some administrative burden on the confirmation of the status. So it's, it helps if you engage early. Okay, so. And just to close on this role, uh, uh, I think it's it's very important to highlight that beyond all this um, very extensive and uh, uh, and uh, I would say um, strong European network of experts and cooperation and stakeholders, EMEA also has uh, established. Uh, regular interactions with other uh, regulatory uh, agencies throughout the world um, and also with other international agencies. Uh, um, it, especially it's, it's important to highlight that for instance for some agencies like for instance the FDA and PMDA in Japan, the, um, uh, the FDA, uh, EMEA has a specific officer that sits within the, that agency to facilitate the, um, the interactions and vice versa. So EMEA currently has a representative from FDA and from PMDA to help also uh, engage on these interactions. Um, I, I saw there was a question in the chat. I'm not sure if I should take it all. Uh, maybe we can move on. To okay, the I will take then the, worry, the questions in the end. The audience, okay. don't worry, put your questions in the chat and then we will go over them during the Q&A, don't worry. Perfect, thank you so much. So, going more on what brings us here, the medical device regulation. As we've mentioned already uh, early, so uh, the role of uh, EMAs on medical device regulation, especially if you compare to its role on medicines uh, regulation, is rather limited. And this is currently the in, the um, the role that is foreseen from the the medicine device um, the medical device regulation the MDR and some of these um, <clears throat> interactions are were also for were already foreseen in the medical device directive so some are new some are not especially this need for instance when we have a medicine combined with a medical device what we call uh, in an integral approach. So the, the device is completely part of the medicine uh, and it's authorized as a medicine on its own. Then the medical device sort of loses this property as medical device itself. It becomes a part of the medicine and it's for the EMEA to assess the safety and effectiveness of the medicine that is used. Um, oh, sorry, uh, apologies. I, 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 um, um, I, I, I was jumping all, all already uh, on the other possibility and I, I don't want to confuse. So there is one thing is the, the incorporation of a medical device in the medicine and if it's a medicine for a centralized procedure, it's this medical device is assessed on its own um, uh, on its own capacity. The other possibility is to have a medicine that is was already, for instance, either authorized by the centralized procedure or it has it falls within the mandatory scope of the centralized procedure or it's a substance that derives from uh, human blood or plasma. And this can be used in an ancillary way in a medical device. So like for instance, the use of an antibiotic to coat a hip replacement, um, uh, a, a hip prosthetic to replace the, 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 the hip joint. Um, so in this case, of course, that the main mode of action for the for the uh, for the for the for the intended purpose is the device and there the medicine is only there to prevent a subsequent infection infection so this is what we call an ancillary use so 
uh, and in this case, so if it's a, a, sub, a, a medicine that falls within this scope, the notified body before granting the authorization of placing on the market the, that medical device needs to ask the EMEA for an opinion on the quality, safety, and usefulness of that substance. You will notice that traditionally when we speak about the authorization of medicines, we use quality, safety, and efficacy. So, but in this case, because it's not a medicine per se, it's used in an ancillary uh, uh, mode of action, we use this term that it's the usefulness. So it would be sort of the, um, the efficacy modulated in its use with the medical device. So these are two uh, roles that they are quite different, but they can sometimes be a little bit um, confused. And one thing that also came, it's new from the medical device regulation, it's this uh, activity regarding um, the, uh, the, uh, the issuing of a scientific opinion regarding medical devices that are made of substances that are systemically absorbed. This is something new that came from the medical device regulation and regards a specific type of uh, medical medical devices that um, actually are considered to be, in terms of concept, borderline with medicines, although their action, it, their mode of action, it's primarily a, a, a physical or mechanical mode of action. So these are the, regarding medical, pure medical devices, these are the three uh, interactions that are currently foreseen. And if we look at the in vitro uh, diagnostic uh, regulation, which Actually, uh, uh, in vitro diagnostics are also medical devices. It's a, a, a particular subset of medical devices. There is a foreseen interaction regarding the, um, the use of companion diagnostics. So the, for the first time, there is uh, a definition and a recognition of a special status for these IVD products. There is this definition for the, what is a companion diagnostic uh, device. And the role of the EMEA within that, that uh, the authorization of such an, uh, an in vitro diagnostic is to issue a scientific opinion regarding the suitability of this companion diagnostic to the medicinal product which it accompanies. So uh, a companion diagnostic is supposed to do one of two things, either to identify patients that would benefit from a certain treatment with a medicine or the opposite, to help exclude patients that would be specifically at risk of having uh, a serious adverse reactions from using that medicine. And so if that being the case, it's for the agency to follow and see whether or not a certain test would be suitable for such a role. <clears throat> we could interpret it as sort of um, um, clinical um, utility, for instance, of the of such device. It would be a, a rough way of trying to understand what is this suitability. And this is a new role. This comes specifically um, from the um, from the MDR and the IVDR, and it's the creation of expert panels on medical devices. Um, this is a group of uh, independent uh, advisors that was set up by the by both regulations of uh, medical devices and diagnostic devices, and the, their um, role is to support the scientific assessment and advice on medical devices. Um, so far, the when they they were set up, the secretariat uh, was provided by the. The, the, the Joint Research Center, um, so uh, uh, part of the European Commission. But since 1st of March 2021, uh, it's the EMEA that provides the Administrative and Technical Secretariat. The role of the expert panels can be um, summarized as being an advisory role whether it's on mandatory consultation procedures, and I will explain this a little bit uh, further on, or regarding the possibility on to advise on 
uh, certain aspects that are not necessarily mandatory uh, foreseen by the regulation. That being the case, for instance, a manufacturer of certain uh, high-risk medical devices can ask for the panels to advise on the, the clinical development strategy or for specific proposals for clinical investigations. Um, 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 uh, I will also speak a little bit on the remit of the of this uh, advice further on, and it's it's also possible that, for instance, <clears throat> member states or the medical device coordination group, for instance, uh, or the European Commission can ask any type of question <clears throat> regarding the safety or um, the the performance of any class of medical device. And also there is a, a prospective role foreseen for the expert panels, apologies, which is the possibility of identifying concerns or emerging issues on the safety and performance also of any device. But all of this, it's, it's, it sits within this advisory role. So it's not, it's, it, expert panels do not grant, for instance, any type of final authorization of placing on the market. So they are an advisory body. This sort of busy slide, I will try to uh, decomplexify it a little bit because visually I think it translates better the activities. So, um, as you know, from certain classes of, uh, of certain risk classes of medical devices, so for, up for class one and some particular uh, subsets of class one medical devices also would need to have a conformity assessment done by, by a notified body. But we would say that from class one onwards, so until class three, the conformity assessment needs to be performed uh, by a notified body. And so it's during this process that the role of the mandatory consultation procedures appears. And it's slightly different for medical devices and for in vitro diagnostics, but the final output is more or less the same. So the result is a critical assessment of what has been the, uh, the, uh, the assessment report of where either the notified body, if we are talking about a medical device, so this rule comes at the end of the conformity assessment. So the notified body has already performed all the activities for the, the assessment and issues this clinical evaluation assessment report and then submits it for the expert panels to issue an opinion on how it was uh, conducted. And the focus of this, um, of this opinion is very much on the, um, for instance, the sufficiency and adequacy of the data that was presented for the assessment, or on how um, the design of the post-marketing clinical follow-up plan encompasses all the, 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 the uh, the serious advance, uh, 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 the serious advance that that might need to be followed in the future regarding the use uh, uh, of that medical device. So it's very focused on the clinical part, but also it's it's very much on what the what was the assessment. So it's a critical review of this assessment. It's the same for in vitro diagnostics. The difference is that in this case. The, that uh, opinion, which in this case becomes a view, is not issued at the end of the conformity assessment, but at the very beginning. So there is no report from the notified body, but it's directly on the report uh, uh, issued by the manufacturer. This is really critical, Miguel, if I could come in. So sure. for, for the entire community, so for MedTech, correct me if I'm wrong, for MedTech, once the C marking process is done and the notified body provides the answer, then EMA comes in and analyzes what has been done. Whereas for, for IVDs, the timing is different. The company can design a clinical validation protocol and then at that point talk to EMA and then execute the clinical validation. Um, let me do some 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 slight uh, clarification on, yeah, on this. So the 
intervention of the of, of the EMEA and the expert panels is done before the placing of the market on either medicines or medical uh, uh, either medical devices or IVDs. So the CMR cannot be granted at the time this opinion is issued. Actually, this opinion or view is issued to strengthen the the work of the notified body. So it's then after this opinion is issued for the notified body to read it and say. Let's imagine, for instance, there is a recommendation to gather further data on a specific aspect of the performance of the device. Then the notified body will say, okay, so I will ask for the not for the manufacturer to provide an additional to set up an additional study or to develop a, um, or to present. Sometimes there are also ongoing studies and, and the conformity assessment. Sometimes it's a long process and sometimes there is already further data available. So it's a matter of uh, also um, in each case seeing what is needed and what can be provided. But it's always before the granting of the C mark. Yeah. So it's sort of a contribution for the conformity assessment. Just to clarify, because I think this is really important for a portfolio. So again, those that go under MDR, they design the clinical protocol, they execute the clinical protocol, then the notified body looks at the data, at the technical file, and of course, before granting CMR, the notified body needs to talk to EMA, and then if EMA says, okay, that's a good data set, we, under, we agree with notified body, the notified body goes back to the company and says, this is your CMR, you got it. That's for those products under NDR, whereas for the products under IVDR, it's a slightly different, no? The timing it, is a bit different. It's 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 more or less what you've described. The difference is that in the 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 in in for the IVDs, the work of the notified body has not started when the expert panels issue their view. So it's at the very early beginning of the conformity assessment. But the, actually, the objective is the same: to contribute to a stronger conformity assessment exercise in both ways, yes. whether at the end, whether. I thought it was really, really critical. So yes, thought, thank you, thank you. So, but this, I would say that also for a manufacturer, there is little intervention on, on the process because the scope of the activity is very much uh, highlighted in the reg in the regulation, and this is an activity that is triggered by the notified body. So, the manufacturer in the mandatory consultation procedures they have a very limited role. Where they can and should have an active role is on the decision, and that's a, a, another role that the expert panels have, to advise early on a clinical development strategy or a specific clinical study. And this comes, of course, very early in the development, so way before the conformity assessment process is set up, and this can be uh, this is a process that has a specific remit, so it's high risk medical devices only, so it's class three medical devices and a very specific set, subset of class 2B that I'll mention further on. But if it's within remit, it is possible to consult the expert panels if the manufacturer so wishes to get advice on this specific uh, development. And here is where I would say that there is a more active role for a manufacturer to decide whether or not he would like to have this um, this support. Very good. So please provide the info to our portfolio about how to contact you um, to get some feedback before they design the, the clinical protocol. Exactly. Yes, I, I will I will go into that. Currently, we are still in pilot mode on this uh, advice to manufacturers, but once this process is uh, set up and more standardized, definitely it will be open and it can be requested to by all developers. And uh, I think it's very interesting for, uh, especially for European developers, because currently there was no uh, mandated uh, body to provide in Europe such type of advice. Um, so just to give you a quick overview on how the panels are organized, so they say are they are divided into clinical areas, <clears throat> uh, and you can see them. There is also um, uh, uh, there are also some web pages on the European Commission's website on how the composition of the um, of the expert panels are. Done, and they, they are set up in the European in the European Commission's website because the setting up and the, for instance, the designation of the members is uh, it's a, a European Commission's uh, specific task mandated by the regulation. 
so just to give you a very short overview on this consultation procedure for medical devices, there is a specific remit, which is for the mandatory consultation procedure. It is mandatory for all class three implantable devices or for class two B active devices that are destined to administer or remove a medicinal product like an infusion pump or an ECMO machine, for instance. So all and uh, these devices would fall in theory in the legal uh, mandate of the mandatory consultation procedure. However, there are some exemptions that are foreseen in the in the regulation that I will not go into detail on this because this is for the notified body to apply and interpret that exemption criteria. But so it's mandatory the, for the notified body, right? The company doesn't have to do anything. Absolutely. The notified body absolutely. Will, okay. Yes, will trigger this and decide whether or not they feel that the, these exemption rules could be one or or, or several could be applicable to the um, to the to the to the product, and so they can choose to exempt it. If that's not the case, they will send it for the panels. And one first specific panel that is sort of an entry for the other uh, um, um, expert panels, the what we call the thematic panels, the the ones that are specifically organized in clinical areas is the screening panel and the screening panel needs is, is tasked with deciding whether or not a specific opinion on the product is needed so because it's understood that this need of having this additional review and support to the work of the notified bodies is not necessary in some cases actually in a lot of cases because sometimes the device is not very innovative it's been on the market for many many years so it's a legacy device that's been transitioning throughout the regulations there is actually nothing very novel there so uh, it's thought that the the work of the uh, of this body of clinical experts and, and technical experts is actually not needed so but the screening panel does need to see the, the type of device and decide whether or not this should be applied. I'm mentioning this novel uh, uh, criteria and uh, its related counterpart on the major possible clinical impact that this device could have because it's both. So it's it needs to be a novel device and have a major clinical impact because this is actually the main criterion for triggering an opinion. But there are also two other uh, criterion more linked to health concerns or to the vigilance uh, system that could also trigger uh, the issuing of an opinion. If that's the case, if there is in the decided that an opinion is needed, the product is sent to a thematic panel of the area. So of course, uh, if it's a, a cardiac device, it will be sent to the circulatory system panel. If it's a neurological device to the neurology panel and so on. And then it's for that panel to issue uh, the, the opinion that we've been discussing. This is a non-binding opinion. It's publicly available on the Commission's website. Uh, but the, um, the notified bodies need to give it due consideration. So it, it is non-binding, but still they need to address it specifically while uh, doing before they complete the conformity assessment. For in vitro diagnostics, as I mentioned, the process in itself, it's not so different, but there are different procedural approaches. This um, part of having it early on the process, so there is no screening uh, panel also, so all devices that fall under the remit can go directly to uh, a view unless they can be exempted also some for, based on some specific criteria set up on the on the regulation. It's applicable to the very highest uh, risk class of in vitro diagnostics, so class D devices. We are talking basically on devices that are used to um, detect um, highly contagious uh, agents, transmissible agents that are responsible for serious uh, diseases like uh, HIV or SARS-CoV-2, for instance or also uh, because this is very linked to the perception of safety regarding um, uh, blood bank uh, activities or blood bank 
transfusion safety mechanisms, also the blood grouping uh, agents for certain classifications of uh, blood grouping types like uh, AB0, Rhesus, Cal, Duffy and Kid are, uh, under, are under the remit. However, the majority of these devices can already be exempted because the regulation had foreseen that if the some common specifications would be published, then the procedure would not be applicable. Common specifications is sort of a, a soft law, if I may present it like that, that contains the technical requirements for the assessment of an, uh, of a, uh, an in vitro uh, diagnostic. So basically, it replaces a view because the intention of the view is exactly that, to provide a sort of a guidance on how that device could be, should be assessed. So that's why it's exempted. And also, of course, if the type of device has already been certified, then probably there are either common specifications or a view published. And so there is no need to undergo the same process. It would be considered a repetition of the process. Again, it's a non-binding view. It's publicly available on the Commission's website and the notified body must give it due consideration. I've mentioned that regarding the additional activities, we are piloting them to make sure that we have a, project, a process that is very fit for purpose and very adapted to the medtech uh, sector uh, needs. This started in February last year and it will end and it will run until June 2024. Um, ways of extending it or complementing it are still being discussed, but there is this um, this is being uh, this is a, a possibility and the the devices that are under remit you will notice that when I mentioned the consultation procedure I mentioned class three implantable devices so here for the advice the remit is a little bit broader so it's class three devices not necessarily just the implantable ones and again, the same subset of class 2B that are an, in, under the mandatory consultation procedure. The area of advice, it's clinical only, it, because that's what is foreseen in the specific article of the MDR that we are using to provide the advice. Currently, there, is, there are no fees being charged during the pilot phase. So it's uh, uh, the advice is being provided with no costs for the applicant. Um, and uh, it's it's uh, it addresses because it's it's the money for the project comes from the budget of EU for Health. Um, it's it it's destined to to support manufacturers or authorized representatives that are um, established uh, in the European Economic Area. And of course, SMEs are much encouraged to submit. While when we started the the pilot, we decided to divide it in two rounds because we needed to balance it with the mandatory activities where we were a little bit afraid of being overwhelmed with requests and not being able to fulfill our mandatory roles. Uh, but because we, we saw that the demand from the applicants was so high that together with the European Commission, the EMEA decided to uh, accept that all the applicants uh, for the pilot at the time would be um, taken um, for this uh, project. So we've received in total for the two phases of the project a total of 39 letters of interest. So that would mean the development of 39 uh, um, uh, medical devices or more because some of them could include accessory devices. They are nicely spread around all clinical areas, which was something that we were um, very much encouraging. So, because of course we always get a lot of requests from uh, cardi the, um, cardiology or orthopedics or neurology, but it was also nice to see that uh, we had requests from other clinical areas so that we can also keep the all the experts from other areas uh, engaged in this project. As you can see from the breakdown of the numbers of the applicants, um, a huge majority, almost 70%, are actually SME companies. So they were very interested in this pilot uh, project. And um, we, we used to call it prioritization criteria because it came from the first phase, but we don't use it anymore now. It's just some, some um, 
breakdown that we use to look at the <clears throat> projects and actually what are the specific characteristics of those projects. And um, uh, almost um, uh, more than 10 of those projects are actually addressing small populations, which is something that also uh, together with the European Commission was very much our focus to address the possibility of uh, supporting uh, what we call orphan devices. Uh, also, um, more than 20 of those projects claim that they are addressing unmet medical need, which is also something that we would target uh, in this project. And um, a huge, huge number is claiming to be uh, developing a novel device. That's why they would uh, ask for the support of the panels on the development. The way the, 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 the advice is provided, it's in written form. It's a question and answer format. So this needs the, some uh, dedicated input from the applicant so that we can make sure that all considerations are taken in this written procedure. But there are moments of interaction with the companies and I just wanted to highlight this. So during the process, there are at least two moments where the experts have direct interactions with the companies and this not in written, so during a meeting. So it's under the pre-submission meeting or with the, the discussion with the applicant before the, the advice is provided, as I've mentioned, in written form. So apologies, I, I extended a little bit the presentation oh, no, but I to clarify a little bit some of ideas. So I'm happy to take any questions you might have. We have some questions in the chat. Just just okay. as a summary, I hope this helped a little bit. Let's see if I understood a key message correctly. Please correct me if this is not the case. Yes. So right now, some so medtech companies can send a letter of interest for advice to EMA. Although you cannot offer this advice to everybody, I know this is a pilot project, but when one of our companies is preparing to go into clinical validation before they, they, they design the clinical protocol, they might get some advice from you, some of them, because it's not totally extended to everybody, right? They could prepare a letter of intent and send it somewhere. How, how could they submit this letter of interest? Thank you for the opportunity to clarify because for the pilot, the ongoing pilot, it's closed. So we are not accepting at the moment applications. As I've mentioned, the project will only be closed uh, in June 2024. So before that, it's difficult to see if this uh, could be we could still be taken some of these uh, applications. I'm saying it's difficult because sometimes there are changes that we also don't, uh, uh, it's difficult to foresee. For instance, now there are huge efforts to support the development of orphan devices. So it's possible that there is, for instance, an additional pilot specifically targeting the, de the development of orphan devices. So that could be the case that we would take them early on. And in, if that is the case, all that you've said absolutely applies. If it's a high risk medical device, a class three device, then definitely I would say that <clears throat> we wouldn't, have, unless we were overburdened with requests, we would definitely uh, be able to provide this clinical support for the development. Perfect. So at some point, probably that advice service will open up. And how would you advise our companies to be in the loop as soon as the service is offered so that they can jump on board so um, as much as possible, we are mm, very much in advance sharing this information on the opening of the of the um, of the project. So when we this was the case with the two phases for the pilot advice, we very much in advance try to um, highlight that. So we have our traditional means of contact. It's via the the updates of the web page, also through our LinkedIn contacts, but also our services reach out to a lot of uh, uh, um, sectors. So manufacturers associations. So we try to spread oh, that okay. very much I around. Keep that. Web, so yes. Keeping an eye on your website, they Absolutely. will see it opening up. That would okay. be my major recommendation, yes. Final 10 seconds uh, question as a summary. Okay, so the, the, the companies keep an eye on your website. If the process is open to request advice, they can request it. If it's not open yet, they have to go at it alone for the time being. So they go on designing the clinical protocol for validation. They run the validation. They prepare a technical file. They submit it to notified body. And they should know, please correct me if I'm wrong, that the notified bodies, in some cases, might have to contact EMA 
to check with you in some cases whether the well always if the clinical protocol was done correctly was executed correctly so they need to get some advice from you the notified body and if the notified body gets advice from you saying we like it we like how things were done then the notified body can continue finalize the process and grant the C certificate the conformity of assessment is that correct it's absolutely correct, Henrik. Thank you so much. You, you summarize. Sometimes it's difficult to summarize. It's a complex topic. Yes, for me, uh, it is. But you've, I think I you've done it business for brilliantly. Yeah, it's like still yeah. complicated. Okay, so I go to the, I go to the chat. First question uh, from Christer: How can an SME in the in vitro diagnostics companion diagnostic space be assisted to be on the correct regulatory path? And that probably applies to everybody else, not in the other paths. How how would you recommend that they get the information they need as fast as they can? Um, that's a, a really good question because I didn't have the opportunity to go specifically into that. Currently, there is no specific mechanism for support of the in vitro diagnostic companies. I think um, you can go to uh, consultants as, as it course. has always been. Commercial. As always, it's been the case. But actually, this is also this is a concern. This is being asked, and actually, there are some ongoing discussions on whether or not in the future it would be possible. For instance, either of course. It, Probably would need a, a revision of the regulation, but to extend a little bit the, the the scope of the expert panels, and I do believe that in the in the future that will be a a, a possibility at least. In in my previous life, what we always did is we found regulatory experts, consultants, and and we just picked up the phone and called them up because we got confused. I, I couldn't understand the because of the density of the text. I would just call up the consultant. That was kind of the standard thing. You have to find somebody who really knows who's a but good because person. currently there are many issues regarding you know the implementation of the IVDR. So uh, there is also uh, a postponement on on the uh, on the application of the, uh, the full regulation. So we do understand that there are issues, and it's also possible that in the meantime there are some complementary mechanisms of trying to provide that support. So I would say again. Keep an eye on our web page so that we can update you on that. Perfect, fantastic, thank you. Um, the other question is, um, I understand there is no data. This is from Agri Adel. Uh, I understand there is no data and marketing exclusivity for new class three devices. I'm not sure I understood that sentence, maybe you did. FDA has six years for PMA. Class three registration is a lot of resources, clinical trial and non-clinical. Why is there no where is this type of rules in the EU? Unfortunately, I cannot answer. I, it's, uh, I think it's different approaches, different regulations. Um, it's difficult to compare to completely different regulatory models. Some have advantages for some things, some have for others. Uh, it's, we do acknowledge that there is this difference. But I cannot uh, give any input on that. Uh, Sorry. Okay. Um, so I understand the question here was saying the resources needed by small companies, for example, seem bigger, larger in Europe than they would be. And also this possibility of granting uh, some some protect some additional uh, um, um, uh, marketing exclusivity protection, which is huge for for a lot of companies true but we don't have that currently for we've never had that actually for medical devices in Europe ever so can you clarify what's a marketing exclusivity for everybody else um, how would that work how does it work um, if it's if it's granted I, I would say that they would protect the 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 the, the it's sort of like a I don't think it's a protective patent but it would be like um they would foster that that device would be sell as a, it's like a, a a prime program kind of or like a breakthrough designation thing. It's you recognize the the uniqueness of the product. Okay, some kind of protection in the market. Okay, um, are medical devices from Chris Erickson are medical devices under NDR entirely separate, being a therapy from in vitro diagnostic devices being a diagnostic? Yes. Those are two different regulations. Yes. yes. Um, another question: Are in vitro diagnostic component uh, devices now considered um, part companion of the new medical device product? Uh, 
No, so this is what uh, um, I also wanted to highlight. They are still uh, IVDs and they are fully medical devices. The only thing that the IVDR brought was the need for this specific type of IVDs if they are considered to be or claimed to be by the developer companion diagnostics, there is this need to seek with the EMEA this usefulness um, um, opinion that adds to the conformity assessment of the IVD. So it's an add-on, it doesn't replace it. It's still an, a medical device, it's regulated and placed on the market as a medical device, an in vitro medical device in this case. What if we have a co-packaged medical device, PMOA, with drug product and ancillary to the medical device? What oh. if we have a co-packaged? I, th I think it, um, I'm not sure if I understood correctly. Co-packaged is, uh, it's a convenience of the user. So it doesn't change the regulatory remit. So it's still a medical device uh, and a medicine. They are just co-packaged for the convenience of who is being authorized. So the two regulations would apply separately to the products. Um, there's another question on the role of EMA, but I think you answered already that one. Uh, the following one, um, in the context of the new personalized medicines, how can the usefulness of a device to screen an ancillary instrument in the development of the drug, a drug be defined? So the usefulness of the device to screen a drug, how can that be defined? Since personalized medicines cannot be assessed outside the single individual. Um, I'm not sure if I understood the question. How is this concept of usefulness assessed? Is is that the question? Uh, so if you're there, uh, Cesar Pascual, do you want to ask the question yourself and then clarify maybe? Are you still online? Yes, um, maybe um, I, I, I don't. Um, the, the question is like, uh, you, you said that the, the criteria to uh, of the EMA uh, to assess a uh, medical device that is ancillary was uh, the usefulness of the device in the therapy. Um, but uh, usually you define the usefulness, I mean, with a statistical role, but uh, for an individual, it's very difficult to, to decide if uh, you have a drug that is going to be useful or not in the personalized medicine. Ah, thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Now, now I fully understand your question. So it's on the ancillary use. Um, I would say that ancillary has nothing very particular of uh, personalized regarding the medicine itself, because once it's an ancillary substance, it loses the status of medicine. It becomes a, a component of the medical device. So that's why when assessing it for, for a centralized procedure, if it falls within the, the, the centralized procedure remit, the of course, that all the characteristics of this of the product need to be assessed, and in this case, the EMEA would be the uh, the the the, um, the the body to consult because it granted an, an opinion or it will be involved in the assessment. So, it would be the source to go to, but it's actually not authorizing the placing on the market, and that's why I mentioned that, unlike any other medicine where they would. Uh, comment on the quality, um, safety and uh, efficacy of the medicine, they would comment on the usefulness, meaning that what would be the possible benefit of having a certain substance being used in, ancillary, in an ancillary mode, like the example I've provided, uh, an antibiotic coating of a, a hip prosthetics. The, the mechanical effect of the mode of action is obviously from the prosthetic, but then, the, so for instance, the EMEA would say whether or not there would be an, a, a benefit or a, that's the usefulness of having use, of using that antibiotic specifically in that uh, condition, which is actually from a medicine's perspective, it wouldn't be the normal way 
of authorizing it. EMEA doesn't authorize medicines that are delivered. Well, they could uh, authorize medicines that are delivered through through medical devices, but those are delivery medical devices. It's not this. I would say it's an unusual way of delivering a medicine, and actually, it's not to deliver a medicine. That we aren't using the hip prosthetic to deliver anti antibiotics. We are using the antibiotics to prevent a subsequent infection that could come from placing, uh, of course, a foreign body. Uh, in the, 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 the full hip uh, replacement. So I think that this concept of personalized would not be, I think, maybe we can think of very specific examples, but if that would be the case, then that would also be taken into consideration. But I don't think that this would be uh, pretty much uh, an issue that would come for this usefulness uh, assessment. Very good. I, we need to... Um... Uh, we're running out of time. There's another question whether well, this is being recorded to be shared. Yes, it's being recorded to be shared. There's another question about um, whether the SME, the small companies alone in deciding the path, and I think you've mentioned this, I mean, it's all written in the regulation. There might be in the future also uh, advice coming from your end if the resources are available. And so it's all written up in the, in the, in the regulation. Uh, but it's easy to difficult to interpret. So the easier thing to do is maybe contact consultants in the space, or keep an eye on EMA's website to see when the pilot advice is 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 available again. Um, okay, for class two B medical device, high risk. Yeah, advice. Yes, we went over this already. Oh, sorry, class two B. That sub specific set only. So the active device is destined to it. Minister or remove a medicinal product. That would be the only type to be that would be under remit. Thank you. Um, well, if there is any kind of fault found in the execution of the clinical study um, when already submitted for review. So, yes, this, yes, we discussed this in our preparation chat already, Miguel. Right? This is... Yeah, it's um, then it's a matter of assessment, of course, but uh, whether a new uh, study would be needed or the study could still some of the data could still be recovered and complemented with some some form of additional study that would be a matter of assessment of course that the expert panels while providing advice could actually uh, comment on that and say whether or not they think there are parts or fully of the study could still be uh, used for uh, additional uh, for for, for um, uh, um, to support uh, the placing on the market there's still a few more questions very quickly. Um, could you clarify the criteria distinguishing substance-based medical devices from those containing substances? Is the systematic absorption the only criteria? Um, actually, uh, there is a specific uh, definition in the MDR that I would invite you to consult on these devices that are what we call substance-based. I said that these were basically it was it, it they were medicines before the implementation of the MDR that were there were ongoing discussions on whether or not there was any pharmacological effect or more of a mechanical effect. So they they were changed under the regulation to This, because they were previously most of them medicines, they didn't want to just lose contact with these pre previous approval processes. So that's why I think this this continuation of having those former medicines now um, change to to move to medical devices as qualification processes to have them also under the scope. So there is a specific definition on that, whether, whereas for the ancillary, it's, it's opposite, it's, it's completely different. So it's like I said, again, uh, some some medicine, usually it's it's always the same. It's a medicine with a specific ancillary function. Uh, so it's an, an immunomodulator that is coating a stent, for instance, to prevent the restenosis of the, uh, of the, um, of the of, of the um, of, of the the the, um, the vessel that was uh, clogged, so it, it it's it's always complementary to the physical property of the of the device. It's a very interesting topic because we're getting many questions. <laughs> the last two questions, and we have to close the session. Um, should safety and efficacy of a new oncology medicine be tried in one and the same clinical trial as its corresponding companion diagnostic, or separately? Um, I'm 
I, I'm, I, I will not be able to comment on that because I think it's very specific. I think that these types of uh, assessments and opinions are quite complex. So I don't want to um, um, generalize by providing something that it's, I think, not very helpful. I think it needs to be looked case by case and each assessment has its own processes of, uh, of being conducted. I just see a comment from uh, one of your colleagues. I believe this is very important, so I wanted to read it out. Just wanted to precise that SMEs are welcome to contact the SME office at the EMA. If it is within our competence, we offer support. And if it is outside our competence, we will redirect your query. So this is really, really useful. I, I appreciate that. Um, there was one final question that I didn't take. It was um, on the chat. Should, um, does a software, maybe it's a bit of an unusual question. Does a software, are you there, Miguel? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? We lost you. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. I okay. think yes, we can hear you. I think we lost we lost Miguel. Miguel trial for regulatory approval of a drug. So it's I, the defin as for any other medical device software can also fall under the scope of being considered a medical device if the definition applies. So we need, I need to see what is the software, what's the intended purpose, and then if it falls or not under the, under the, the, the definition. It's difficult to just uh, say whether or not it would fall. I think it's, it depends a little bit on the intended, it, it depends not a little, a lot, or mostly on the intended purpose of the software. Very good. So um, I just want to thank you, uh, Miguel, for your time. It's, a your questions. <laughs> it's such a complicated topic. But it's so important, and, it and is, your knowledge is. is so deep. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for your time again. Thanks. Thank you. I hope audience. it was useful also. So thanks everyone, and thanks to my colleagues, and and let's stay in contact, Miguel, because I'm sure from absolutely. From the